This very unloved Seiko watch is really quite beaten up. I'm fairly certain that it was manufactured in the late 1960s. <laughs> this watch is older than me. It does not run for any length of time, and judging from the service marks inside the watch back, I suspect it's only been serviced a couple of times, and I've no doubt that this is mostly due to the actual value of the watch. Well, these models are very low cost, and quite often would be much cheaper to replace than to contract a watch repairer to service the movement at regular intervals, unless of course the watch was of particular sentimental value. This watch has simply been sitting in my scrap drawer for many years, and whilst I was looking for something else, I noticed it and decided that it would be a nice, enjoyable project to put the watch back into service. Right off the bat, I can clearly see that the dial is in extremely poor condition. It looks as if the lacquer has started lifting away from the dial, and indeed, the dial is pretty stained. I would suspect that the watch may have had moisture ingress and was possibly steaming up over a long period of time. It is quite possible that the reason the movement is not running, aside from the obvious lack of lubrication, is the dial lacquer flaking and lodging itself under the dial. The movement is a Seiko manufactured caliber 6216A, an automatic winding module with a day and date calendar mechanism. The goal here will be to restore the watch to a fairly good standard without breaking the bank, as the watch is simply not worth much financial investment. But in order to achieve even a fairly good standard, there are several hoops which need to be jumped through, the dial being the most obvious hoop. The Perspex crystal and the watch case are very rough looking, so, well, there's another hoop. And of course, the movement will need to be stripped down and cleaned. Now, I'm not a professional dial restorer by any means. I have been playing with water slide laser printer decals recently, which is not perfect, but affords acceptable results. But anyway, let's get cracking. First, I need to strip the watch down and see if there's any broken parts that I need to replace.
So I've stripped down the movement and whilst it is in the cleaning machine, I can work on the watch case. I can see there are no cracks in the crystal, so I'm going to give the case and glass a really good polish up on the motor. The dial is in very bad condition. I can see the lacquer is peeling away from the dial and the silver finish is rather stained. I can place the dial in some acetone to remove the old lacquer and loosen any glue which may be holding the dial chapters and the logo. And now I can remove all those chapters, the calendar window and the Seiko logo. Now I can remove the old silver finish and sand in a fine grain ready for fresh silvering. And now I have a nice grain, I can clean the dial with acetone and then apply silver powder which deposits a fine amount of silver to the brass. Now as I've already admitted, I'm not a dial restorer by any stretch of the imagination. I have worked on watch movements since I was in my late teens, but I've only recently become interested in learning processes to create finishes on watch dials. I will confess that this is actually my very first attempt at dial silvering.
And now the dial is prepared, I can recreate the original printing which had the wording Seiko-Matic and Diashock 39 joules just above the 6 o'clock position. To do this, I can use these papers made by Sunny Scoper. There's a link in the description of this video. These papers allow you to print water slide decals on a laser printer. And for best results, the DPI of the printer should be at least 1200. I can load a sheet of the decal paper in my printer tray, and using a photograph of the original dial, I can recreate the wording in Adobe Illustrator. But I understand Inkscape is a good free alternative to this software. Now I can apply the decal to the prepared dial. First, I cut the printout to a manageable size. I place the piece in some clean water and allow it to soak for a few moments. This loosens the decal from its backing paper. I can drop a little bit of water on the dial and place the decal face down and then slide the backing paper fully away. The drop of water provides a little lubrication to allow me to position the decal correctly. And at this stage, I wish I'd printed some guidelines onto my design. I made a mental note to do this next time. When I'm happy with the position, I can then carefully squeegee the excess water and any air bubbles trapped from under the decal. And now I can place the dial in an oven at a temperature of 100 degrees C for around 15 minutes. When the dial has cooled down, I can carefully peel away the plastic and if all has gone well, the laser toner will have softened in the heat and adhered to the dial surface. I'm not happy with the thickness of the line art for the Seiko-matic wording, and also there are a few issues with toner scattered around the dial. I believe this is because I cut through some toner with my scissors, which was a mistake. In short, it worked, but I'm not happy with the result. So I modified my design in Illustrator and re-prepared the dial to try again. I'll get rid of the black ring in the design and use guidelines at the 12, 6 and 9 positions instead. And with the dial cleaned up and prepared, I can go through the whole process of applying the decal again. And I can use the guides at 12, 6 and 9 to better position the decal. I can already see that the line art looks much cleaner. All good so far. After another 15 minute bake at 100C, the moment of truth. I peel the plastic away and, well, although it's better, 
it seems the number 3 has not adhered to the dial correctly. Now this is a pain because cleaning up and preparing the dial takes a very long time and I've already done this twice so far. If I simply look at the dial without magnification though, it is hardly noticeable due to the fact that the lettering is very small. So I was inclined to chalk this up to experience and get on with the next stage. I made a mental note to experiment with applying two coats of decal next time, should the first coat have any issues. So I lacquered the dial and turned my attention to the dial decorations. Using some polishing compound and some pegwood, I polished each of the dial chapters and the calendar window. And after cleaning them, I reapplied them to the dial and I thought it all looked rather good. A massive improvement. But then I made a mistake. I loaded up some of the footage I shot of the process so far on my computer. I filmed these videos with a macro lens and in 4K. When I reviewed my footage, I could not stop looking at that number 3. It just bugged me too much. So I whipped off the dial decorations and I started all over again. And this time I was absolutely determined to get it right. I placed the dial into some acetone and said goodbye to several hours of work. And after sanding and then re-silvering the dial, I was ready to apply the decal again. I baked the dial and removed the film. And although I did not capture this on camera, Sure enough, some toner came away again from the dial, but I decided to apply another decal on top by lining up the guides and making sure that the lettering was exactly on top of the previously applied toner. I baked the dial one more time and here we have another moment of truth. Well, it seems that applying the same decal twice has produced a much improved result. That's it, I'm happy with that, let's move on. After lacquering, I reapplied the dial decorations and after all these attempts, decided that enough was enough. Under magnification, it's not perfect by any stretch, but in all fairness, it looks very nice regardless when not using a 90mm macro lens and magnifying it on a high resolution computer monitor. Alright then, let's get the movement reassembled. I have had all the components in the cleaning machine with the end cap still in place, as is my usual method. I now need to remove these and manually clean them in a degreaser so that I can apply lubrication. I do this for all the end stones on the main plate, the train bridge and the balance cock. And now I can replace the train of wheels.
Turning my attention to the dial side, I can now install the calendar driving wheel. And now I can install the keyless works. And now I can install the balance and escapement. It's always a good sign when the heart starts beating. Now I can test the movement and after a little bit of tweaking, the movement seems to perform quite well. The beat error is within tolerance, as is the average rate between positions. And the amplitude is where I would expect it to be, at around 260 degrees. For a watch which is almost half a century old, I will take that. Apologies for my handheld footage here, I was just a bit lazy to set up a tripod. Now I can continue and reassemble the calendar works. And with that done, I can turn my attention to the automatic mechanism. Now that the movement is reassembled, I can replace the dial and hands.
These hands look pretty rough under magnification, but they are chrome-plated brass and so polishing them is not an option. And now for the final job, putting it all back together. And with that, I'm happy to say that this job is complete. Was it worth it? Well, from a financial point of view, absolutely not. But I didn't do this for money. It was a nice little project and a very old and tired wristwatch has been plucked out the scrap drawer and placed back into service. It's a good feeling and it looks a lot better to boot. I'm glad I did it. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And if you like my content and want to see more, then please subscribe if you're not already done so. It's free. And if you click the bell, you'll be informed whenever I publish new videos. And check out my Facebook and Instagram for details of upcoming projects. This video was made possible by all those who supported me via Patreon. Thank you so, so much. And with that said, I'll see you next time.